don't we just all sing together just for a moment. symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David king of Israel and they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel and all the people shouted with a great shout Somebody say, all the people. All the people. Hallelujah. With a great shout. When they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Somebody say a loud shout. Loud shout. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the children of Israel had been through quite an ordeal. And they had brought it upon themselves. And the Bible tells us that when they came out of Egypt, 
that the Lord gave them a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he appointed them to follow after him. And he's done the same thing for us today. Yes, he, he said, follow me. Right, right. He said, pick up your cross and follow after me. He didn't say, I'm going to follow after you. Right. He, he didn't say that we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah, he right. says, put your eyes upon me yes, and yes. follow me. Yes. And this is exactly what he told the children of Israel. He says, follow after the smoke yes. and follow after the, the fire follow me because God was in that smoke and God was in that fire and he wanted them to always know that his presence was nearby and that they could trust him that he wasn't going to abandon them and I can only imagine that as they followed after that fire that went before them that if he led them into enemy territory that there was some comfort in knowing that God went before them they wasn't wandering off into uncharted territory God was leading them into wherever it was that he was taking them and they trusted that if he went before them that he wouldn't lead them into destruction that he wouldn't lead them to be destroyed that he wouldn't lead them back into captivity that wherever he took them he was able to bring them through it and that he was able to give them the victory somebody say amen Hallelujah, because whenever we follow after the Spirit of God, whenever we follow after the pillar of God, we can have great confidence in knowing that we're following after the one who can bring us through. Hallelujah. And as I began to wonder about how they would begin to grumble and how they would begin to complain and how they would begin to look back at Egypt. And I wonder how long that it took, Brother Godwin, before they got accustomed to the pillar of smoke. I wonder how long it was before they became accustomed to the pillar of fire. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just get accustomed to the Spirit of God. I don't want to just get calloused to the Spirit of God. I don't want to come to the place to where I take the Spirit of God for granted and say, well, it's always been there. He showed up one day at an altar and filled me with the Holy Ghost. And when I need Him, He's there. But you know what? I remember when. Yeah. And start looking back while the pillar of God is standing in front of me. And I've grown so cold and so callous that I can't recognize that the Spirit of God is right in front of me. That He's leading me. And that He's guiding me. And that somehow, if I get to the place to where that doesn't mean nothing to me, then chances are real good I've turned my back on that pillar of fire and on that pillar of smoke. And I'm heading off in the wrong direction of grumbling and complaining and looking towards Egypt. When what I really need to do is turn back and run to that pillar of fire and run to that pillar of smoke and say, God, I've messed up. I, I've turned away from you. God, I repent. I need to get some of this out of my life. I need to run back to that consuming fire. And I need to take care of some things at an altar of repentance. If I have become accustomed to that dear fire and that smoke that God's given in our life. Hallelujah. Amen. But somehow, that's what happened. But the Bible says that God gave direction to Moses to build a temple. To build a tabernacle, rather, in the wilderness. And it said that, that uh, whenever he had done everything just perfectly. And in Exodus 40. Whenever he had done as, as he had been told to do, the Bible says, Hallelujah, Jesus. Then they, and he reared up the court round about, this is in verse 33 of chapter 40, and he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. He had finished all that God had told him to do. He had been obedient to all that God had instructed. And now the tabernacle was as God wanted it to be. It was all just, it was exactly how God had instructed. And it said then, not before he had been obedient, but after he had been obedient, it said then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord 
filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud above thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I want to tell you something today that when you're obedient to God and you put Him first place in your life and you trust in Him and all that His Word has told you to do and you've been obedient to His instruction, then the glory of God will fill the tabernacle. This right here is a, is a, a, a type and shadow of God filling that tabernacle that was to come. You and I, the Bible says, know ye not that ye are the temple of the Lord, that you are to keep yourself holy and pure before God. He's not going to come into an undefiled temple and He's not going to do things on our terms. But when we're obedient to Him, you can rest assured that the glory of God will fill the temple and that it will change your life. Hallelujah. And I don't want to ever become accustomed to that glory of God. And I began to notice that several times throughout the Old Testament that the glory of God filled the temple. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read every account, but you'll find that in, in Chronicles, when Solomon had built the temple and had done everything as he was instructed to do, that the Bible says that the glory of God came and filled the temple again. And it said that the, the glory of God was so strong that the priest had to get away, that they couldn't minister because the anointing was so strong and the power of God was so strong that they had to respond by getting away. And I want to tell you something. Whenever the power of God comes into your life and the glory of God fills your temple, there's no room for the flesh. They, they couldn't come into the temple because their temple was flesh and they would die under the presence of the glory of God. Whenever the glory of God fills our life, there's no room left for the flesh. The flesh has to stay on the outside of the camp because there's no room for the flesh where the glory of God fills the temple. He's not going to coexist with darkness. He's not going to mingle with evil. If we try to do things on our terms, the glory of God is going to be absent in our life. Hallelujah. But when we understand that flesh cannot come into that temple where that glory is at, then we understand, we can begin to understand why He says we must die. That flesh must die and we become a new creature in Christ. It's not me and Him, it's Him. It's the glory of God abiding within a temple that He's given me. My flesh has to die. My flesh has to submit. It has to yield to Him. In order for Him to fill my temple, I've got to get out of the way. Yes. Hallelujah. And so as we follow along, we'll find that the temple of God, the house of God, that His glory dwelt there. And that there was a holy place there. And you can go into Numbers and a couple places where it talks about this pillar of fire and this pillar of smoke. And it said that whenever that pillar of fire stopped, they stopped. And it said whenever that pillar of fire got up and moved, they got up and moved. It said that whenever that pillar of fire if it set down for one day, they sat down for one day. And if it sat down for two weeks, they sat down for two weeks. And if it sat down for two years, they sat down for two years. They said, God, wherever you lead, I'm following. And wherever you place me, I'm staying. Wherever you're at, that's where I'm going to be at. We ain't got no room in our lives to be impatient, Brother Godwin. Whenever he tells us to move, we move. When he tells us to stay, we've got to learn to stay. We've got to do exactly what the Spirit of God is leading us to do. We have to come to a place in our life where we're sensitive to the Spirit of God to know when He's moving us and when He's telling us to set still. Otherwise, we'll find that we've got up and we've left camp and we're all alone. And we've got nobody leading us. And we've got no one guiding us. And we say, oh God, where are you at? Where are you at? And he says, I'm back here where you left me at. We've got to follow after the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And we know that the children of Israel didn't do that. 
that over time that they, they, they turned away from God and they turned to their own devices and they turned to other gods and they started corrupting the temple. And the time came, and I don't want to be long-winded about this, but the time came when God said, enough is enough. I'm going to withdraw my spirit from this place and I'm going to allow the enemy to have it. And so they went into captivity. He says, I'm not leaving you forever. I'm not abandoning you forever. But I will not fellowship with darkness. And my glory will not be in an unholy place. And so if this is how it's going to be, then I'm leaving you for a time. And so this is what he allowed to take place. And they went into captivity. But then a time passed. And God remembered them. And he says, it's time to bring them back home. It's time to bring them back home. And they said, oh, but it's broken. The temple is destroyed. There's nothing left but ruins. There's nothing left but rubble. There's nothing to go back to. And he says, I'm going to restore all that was lost. I'm going to restore all that was lost. And I'm going to make a way for you. And all that's been taken is going to give, be given back. And all those holy uh, articles that was in the temple are going to be given back. And, and things are going to return to the way that they was. And here we find in Ezra that after their fair amount of trials that they've come and they've laid the foundation. Sister Sandra, the temple wasn't built yet. The house wasn't constructed yet. The walls weren't up yet. The furniture hadn't been brought in yet. The glory of God hadn't even fell yet. The only thing that they had done was laid the foundation. And they said, stop. Stop. Get the priest. Get the trumpets. Get the cymbals. Get all the worshipers together because the foundation has been laid for the temple. The work has begun. The foundation has been poured. And it's time to start worshiping and start praising God. Some people are waiting for the temple to get finished. Some people are waiting until there's imperfection in the temple. Till there's perfection in the church and, and everybody's got it just right. And, and they're looking at their brothers and they're looking at their sisters and they're saying, oh, but look what's in their life. Look at this and look at that. I want to encourage somebody today to quit pointing the finger at your brother and sister and look at the foundation that's been laid and get excited about the foundation that's been laid. Start looking about what's been done and stop looking at what's been done yet. Hallelujah. God is moving miraculously in this church. God is, is bringing us to a place to where He wants us to elevate us to a new level. And we're only going to be able to do that when we can notice the foundation that's been laid, even though the walls ain't up yet, even though the roof's not been put on yet, even though everything's not been brought in. Everything's not perfect yet. But the foundation's been laid. And that ought to bring us up off our seats. That ought to bring us up off our seats. That ought to cause us to blow the trumpet. That ought to cause us to bring the cymbals together. That ought to cause us to get so loud that the people across town says, what's going on down there at the Pentecost of the Southern Illinois? And when they come to the door, they say, what are you all so excited about? Because the foundation's been laid. The foundation's been laid.
and started looking around and saying, we can't worship God unless we have a concrete. We need walls. We need a roof. We need... And I began to look at that. And there was two types of people. There were the ancient men that was full of sorrow because they had seen the glory of Solomon's temple before. And then there was those that come out of captivity that were just excited that the foundation was laid. And those old men were weeping and they were crying because all they could do was remember what used to be. All they could do was remember what used to be. Somehow or another they couldn't remember what God had promised them. What God had told them. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. In the book of Haggai, the Bible tells us in chapter 2 about the comparison of the temple that was going on. And he said in verse 2, Speak now to Zerubbabel the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as if it was nothing? Yeah. Oh God, I hope that there wouldn't be anyone here today that would say, this foundation that's being laid doesn't even compare to the glory of yesterday. This doesn't even compare to what used to be. There's never going to be miracles like there once was. People are never going to pray like they once prayed. They're never going to fast like they once fast. Uh, this world is too evil and we're too caught up in it. And the glory of God just ain't like it used to be. And we're just seconds away before we're all going to be caught out of here. If not, we're all going to be lost because everything's so bad. Yeah. And I'm not making fun of nobody. But I want you to know that the Bible says uh, in Ezra that the noise of those that shouted... For the foundation that was being laid was louder than the ones that was crying. And God's going to hear a people that will say, hey, the foundation's been laid. There's still hope yet. All's not lost. God's still in control. The power of God's still coming. I'm still being led by that, that there pillar of fire and that pillar of smoke. I'm still shouting over a foundation that's been laid. Hallelujah. He says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be strong. Be strong. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Be strong. Keep on working. Keep on building. The foundation's been laid. It's not time to quit. Yes, there's walls that has to be built. Yes, there's a roof that has to be put on. There's some decorations still yet to be made before it's all beautiful, before the finished product is done. But don't stop working. Don't stop giving up. Don't start, don't start throwing in the towel yet. He says, keep on working. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. I have not left you. I have not forsaken you. I'm still here. And maybe you can't do it on your own. But maybe you can do it with me. Yes, amen. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. He said, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, And I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. It's not time to start lamenting. It's not time to start crying. It's time to start shouting. The foundation's been laid. The house is going up. The temple's being constructed. The Holy Ghost is being poured out. And this here latter house is going to have more glory than the former house ever had. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to get up off their seat and give God a shout of praise. Somebody needs to let the neighbors hear you shout about Somebody needs to say, I'm not going to look at what's wrong. 
Zechariah verse 5 and the angel that talked with me answered and said to me knowest thou not what these be and he said no my Lord and he answered and spake to me saying this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel y'all remember Zerubbabel don't you he's the one building this here foundation he says not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, that thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying grace, uh, grace unto it. I'm going to tell you something today, that God is looking down, and he's saying, not by your strength, not by your might, not by something that you worked up in your flesh, not by some emotion that you generated, but I'm going to tell you it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And you're going to come to a place where you're going to say into that mountain, remove yourself from my way, and it's going to become a plain. You're going to look at that valley, and you're going to say, rise up, valley, and it's going to become a plain, because those mountains are going to be moved, and those low places are going to be smooth. When the Spirit of the Lord is giving direction and you're following after the anointing of God, it's not by us, it's by Him, saith the Lord God. Hallelujah. 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 Look what He did to Haggai. Look what He said in Haggai. He said, how in the world, how in the world does somebody that come out of captivity have so much authority? How does someone that come out of captivity able to lay a foundation that's going to bring more glory than that former house? How is this going to happen? The Bible says that it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And then he says in Haggai chapter 2, verse 21, speak to Zerubbabel. Here comes another prophet speaking into the life of this man. He says, speak to him. And this is what I want you to say. I will shake the heavens and the earth. I'll shake it all for you. I'll break it all loose for you. And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. And I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and their riders shall come down. Everyone by the sword of his brother. He says, I'm going to turn them against themselves. Do you remember what happened when you came out of Egypt? I'm going to do it again. I'm going to destroy the heathen. I'm going to destroy the enemy. You see a mountain? I don't see a mountain. You see a valley? I don't see a valley. I'm going to take that which looks like an impossible to you, and I'm going to show you how great I am. My glory is going to fill your life, and it's going to transform you into something that you can never get on your own. I'm going to give you the strength. I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you peace like you've never known. And then I'm going to go one step further. And I'm going to give you authority. Watch what he says. In that day, says the Lord of the hosts, in that day will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel.